Hello everyone, I am uh, Nitish Moodya, MROG Lab Director in Indra IVF. Uh, today we have with us uh, David Hansen, uh, who is the President of uh, Fertility and Genomics Division of Cooper Surgical with us. Uh, and we welcome you here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have him here. And uh, today we are going to talk about uh, uh, what are the current trends in, in IVF, what is the technology uh, that is shaping the future. Uh, through David and, and David has been in the healthcare segment for almost 10 years mm -hmm. uh, and, and he has traveled across the world and, and, and he has a lot of experience going to different labs, going to different centers, interacting with different doctors um, and, and we would like to hear uh, your comments, your uh, vision, uh, the way you see this IVF segment uh, shaping up in future. So this world is full of technology and there are a lot of new technology coming uh, into the IVF space and uh, uh, the doctors, the patient, the embryologist, everyone is confused, you know, what, what kind of technology will really help patients. Uh, so, my first question to you, David, is uh, about the embryo imaging incubators. Uh, how do you see uh, them adding value uh, to especially the patient? And, and how do you see this technology shaping the IVA future? If we look at the clinical value, I do not believe it has been really proven yet that there is an actual clinical value in the way that we're using the embryoscopes uh, or the, the images today. I think that value will come later. I think that it will come at the point in time where the data uh, that has been generated, all the pictures are actually being processed uh, in the cloud and are being held up against a much larger uh, reference data set. At that point in time, it may have clinical value to actually assess the pictures with uh, artificial intelligence in, in order to be able to uh, select, uh, potentially forecast. I think though that the fact that the embryoscope has been implemented in clinical practice in I think more than 1000 clinics around the world um, has had another benefit. It has had the benefit of actually standardizing the treatment protocols. Uh, by no means is a better media uh, per se, but the value has actually been harvested in that nobody's actually touching the embryos for the period of time that these embryos are inside the, uh, the embryo scope. And by having the embryos left alone in single step media, we've actually seen a standardization of treatment, which has been helpful, I believe, downstream for a lot of the, uh, of the clinics. So David, there has been a lot of talk uh, on genetics and, and how genetics is playing a role in IVF segment. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think that, uh, uh, how is the genetics helping patient and what is coming new in the genetic analysis segment in future? In the genetic segment, we are primarily uh, talking about the PTT. Uh, the PTT testing uh, is either a screen for euploidy of the embryos, or it is a diagnostic of the embryos uh, if you sus suspect that there is some kind of a genetic uh, problem with, uh, with one of the, uh, of the potential parents. Uh, the biggest test today is the PTT um, uh, testing, uh, which screens for euploidy. It has proven, I believe, along with ICSI, to be probably the biggest uh, innovation within the fertility segment in the last uh, 10 years. Um, the benefits for the patients is that by implementing genetic testing, uh, you are screening the embryos so that you test if the embryos are actually viable can these become a baby eventually? And therefore, I believe that that has contributed to the success rates increasing dramatically when using the PTT testing. It has also shown to reduce the number of miscarriages significantly. So there's a lot of benefits to the PTT testing. But it also uh, helps by using the artificial intelligence, uh, you're also able to identify embryos that actually could be viable, but uh, would previously be discarded in clinical practice. So we see many more euploids uh, embryos being uh, available and potentially, therefore, many more babies coming out of the IVF treatment if the IVF if treatment is using uh, PDT testing. As we all know that embryologists play a very crucial role in the success of an IVF cycle. Uh, and uh, the life of an embryologist is getting more stressful due to regulations, due to data work, due to a lot of uh, advanced level technology coming uh, into the lab, right. uh, which involves a lot of uh, uh, 
टाइम फ्रॉम देम टू डू थिंग्स अदर देन द नॉर्मल एम्ब्रोलॉजी लैब प्रोसीजर्स डेविड हाउ डू यू सी दैट ऑटोमेशन कमिंग इन टू द एम्ब्रोलॉजी लैब वी हियर अलॉट ऑफ रोबोटिक्स बींग कमिंग इन द लैब एंड एंड हाउ डू यू सी द फ्यूचर ऑफ यू नो रोबोटिक्स प्लेइंग इन द एम्ब्रोलॉजी लैब all the typical procedures in a laboratory uh, is being left up to the embryologist so that the embryologist needs to be a superhuman uh, in order to uh, to manage all the uh, the protocols inside the uh, the embryology uh, laboratory then for sure it will be stressful but the clinics that are able to plan and to standardize the protocols uh, chew them up into smaller uh, bites so they are easier to manage Uh, standardize them, control them carefully. They will uh, also help the embryologist to have much, much less stress and much more focus on the on the patients. So I think it's very much up to the practices of the clinics uh, as to how they actually use their relatively limited uh, embryology resources and how they use the other resources they have inside the laboratories. The good in order to get robotics working, you actually need to first. Uh, ensure that you have a strong digital platform that you collect the data uh, that you want to have the KPIs you need to have around your different protocols so that you standardize everything you do inside the laboratories only then does it make sense to do robotics we've seen a lot of robotics in other areas if you look at the microbiology laboratories they have had robotics for many many years robotics that essentially is doing the same as is being done today inside the IVF laboratories i believe that, that will be the same way that we will see progression of robotics inside the IVF labs uh, they would beat patients or doctors everyone wants to uh, have a 100% IVF success rate uh, for any cycle that they do uh, how much is it achievable going forward and uh, uh, which area do you see or which front do you see in in in, in the future Uh, where the world needs to pay more attention uh, into getting more technology advancements uh, is it more clinical oriented or is it more embryology oriented um first of all i don't think that we will ever reach uh, 100% i'm not aware of any uh, healthcare procedure that actually guarantees a 100% outcome but i think we will be uh, very close i think we will be probably uh, above 80% uh, easily in the best clinics uh, in the world uh once you are above 80% you are able to actually change your business model so that the the patients uh the payers insurance companies governments etc uh will be able to uh cut a deal with you uh in your laboratory whereby you risk share uh so that the patients are guaranteed to get a baby or they will get their money back it's only valid for the clinics that actually know their data their risk their performance and are able to uh, to manage such a business model so the better we can become in creating babies out of ivf the more funding there will be available and again this this is a a a good circle because it means there is a much much higher chance to get a baby in the future there has been a lot of buzz in india about uh, witnessing and especially electronic witnessing right. uh, according to you uh, what role does it play you know especially for embryologist and uh, patients uh, and uh, how do you see this technology uh, aiding uh, to the future analytics uh, in terms of uh, embryology lab first of all i think that with uh, electronic witnesses is not only in in india it's actually in all countries uh, right now that we see uh, electronic witnessing being implemented uh electronic witnesses uh, witnessing uh, ensures that you are able to track the uh, the gametes so the eggs and the sperm and the in uh, the embryos all throughout the treatment to make sure that there is no mix up uh, that also guarantees for the patients that the baby they get home is actually their own baby so i think that over time electronic witnessing will actually be a a mandatory it will be requirement uh, on the law uh, to have electronic witnessing so i think that is uh, going to be a fundamental uh, technology going forward now with this technology you can actually do a lot more uh, you can use the uh, the data that you generate in a witness uh, system uh, uh, to combine and combine this data with a lot of other information 
uh, about the patient, about the embryo, about the the, the drugs that the the patients have been been uh, been, been using uh, to uh, to generate uh, um, uh, the the eggs. Uh, you can combine it with the uh, the uh, uh, information about the temperature, the VOC, the CO2, all these parameters that you're working under inside a laboratory. And once you have all that information, you can combine it with genetic information, you can combine it with information about the baby, and suddenly you will be able to generate a, a data set that is uh, in, in, in allow you to tailor the treatment to the individual patient and allow you to get a much, much uh, more uh, and better data uh, for your treatment going forward. So David, as you rightly said that genetics is really going to be the future in terms of uh, the IVF technology. But what, what, what we want to understand from you is that how does the world moving towards a non-invasive technique for, for an embryo uh, evaluation and prediction model from the current uh, invasive procedure and how do you see this whole field changing and what really has been working till now? That is a, an interesting thought um, because uh, the question is, will this make the, uh, the genetic testing much easier? Right now, I do not believe that is the case. Uh, there's a couple of tests out there that has been launched, but the accuracy is not yet good enough. The, having said that, there will be other non-invasive technologies emerging as well. One in, non-invasive technology we discussed before is the morphology assessment via imaging. So looking at an image uh, of the embryo or looking at a video sequence uh, to assess whether that uh, embryo is actually a euploid or not. Uh, another technology that we see emerging is uh, metabolomics. Uh, metabolomics simply means that you're collecting essentially the, the, uh, the, the protein uh, as it is being expressed from the, uh, from the embryo and you're looking to see if you can find patterns in, in this as well. So it's just simply another technology. Um, these technologies, I think, eventually will combine. So you will have genetics, you will have metabolomics, you will have the images you're looking at. You might have a, have a couple of other technologies that you're adding in uh, so that you, during an IVF practice, will be able to collect uh, and assess the embryo in many more different ways than we are doing right now. But I think that non-invasive PDT testing is just one of many different types of tests that we'll see going forward that eventually will be, could be combined into one robot or one box uh, or one process uh, in the future. Uh, so David, uh, my next question is actually for the budding embryologists and doctors or you know doctors who have been trying to put up a new IVF center. Right. Uh, uh, for them, they really want to know what actually contributes to the overall uh, you know success uh, result for an IVF cycle. Is it is it the technology and the equipment or is it the embryologist and the fertility doctor or is it the, the stimulation and the lab protocols? You know, it's, it's, it's a bit confusing for, you know, people uh, who are venturing new into this field. They right. really want to, you know, know what, what actually is responsible for the overall IVF success rate. Right. Um, I think they all contribute, obviously. Um, but I also believe that you can have as good a tool, as good an equipment as you want, but if you do not understand the embryology practices and if you do not understand uh, the whole clinical biology uh, around the patient, uh, understand how patients differ and understand the impact of the different protocols you're trying to work with, then it doesn't really matter. Uh, so I think the focus has to be on the processes. Uh, the minute that you can standardize your processes, you can control your processes, you can also understand what happens when I make a change to that process, you will be able to measure inputs and outputs of that process and learn as you go along. My recommendation though would be to, uh, to look to the best in the industry and how they have built the, uh, the, the processes. Uh, comp uh, big uh, companies like, uh, like Indira uh, has built a, a, a process that they have implemented globally. Very few uh, clinics today have done that. Uh, and they are religiously adhering to those processes in order to learn every day. In vitro fertilization as a segment is, is very fast evolving. There has been a lot of changes uh, coming up. There has been a lot of transformations happening in technology, equipment, media, 
uh, and and even the protocols. Okay. Uh, so, David, how do you see that? Uh, you know how the last decade uh, things have changed in the IVF industry uh, globally. Right. Uh, and 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 compare it with the next phase of the growth or next decade. What do you see the new changes coming into the future? Right. I think the last ten years uh, we saw a lot of interesting technologies coming up. Uh, one of the most prevalent now is the ICSI, uh, a new technology that is being used on how to combine the uh, the, the the sperm and the egg. Um, we have seen a move. Uh, towards uh, freezing uh, all the uh, the embryos, uh, even the uh, even uh, most of the of the eggs. So there is a general move towards more freezing. We see also a move towards uh, in, inserting fewer embryos uh, than was done uh, previously. Previously, we actually saw clinics uh, in, in inserting as much as four to five embryos at a time, which is a little crazy. Um, I think that the, the, the trend that we have seen the last uh, few years is that there will be an, an, an insertion of max two embryos uh, per procedure. We've also seen a diagnostic uh, involvement uh, via the genetic testing. Um, and we have seen uh, a lot of uh, involvement in the uh, acceptance of uh, IVF uh, in general. Today, it is generally accepted that infertility hits around one in six uh, couples. Uh, it is generally accepted by World Health Organization as a disease, uh, and, and meaning that there is a right for the patients to actually re re receive uh, treatment uh, offerings uh, for this. Uh, so we will see an explosion in the uh, cryotechnologies, a lot of more patients coming into this space, we will see more money and more support from government, from insurance companies, from fertility benefits managers. Uh, they will be supporting this area because the industry is maturing. So, David, IVF segment has been catching a lot of eyeballs. And, right. and how do you see uh, investors' uh, interest in this particular field? Uh, as well as uh, how do you see uh, the growth happening in this particular segment uh, across the various continents worldwide? So right now, the uh, the IVF industry is, uh, is an industry that is assessed to be around seventeen billion dollars worth. Uh, so a very uh, big industry, uh, but it has a lot of room to grow. Uh, the investment bankers that I talk to, they expect that this industry will grow uh, more than to, to more than double within the next uh, five to six years. So it's quite significant. So there's a lot of exciting uh, areas right now in terms of growth. Uh, I believe that the growth in the U.S. will continue in the range of 6 to 7 percent. Uh, investment bankers believe it might be a little bit more if we consider the, uh, the genetic testing that is right now exploding in the, uh, in the U.S. In Europe, it's a little bit more conservative, a little, little bit more settled. Europe is still the largest area for IVF, but is also the more mature uh, area here and the one that is late to adopt new technologies so here we will see a growth of around 5 to 6%. In Asia Pacific, we will see a growth of somewhere between 6 to 9% in the next years. Uh, most investment bankers believe that in India, the growth will be around 7%. I do believe it will be more as we will also see new technologies uh, and new funding technologies, uh, funding area, areas coming into this space in India. David, thank you very much for coming all the way uh, to Indra IVF from Denmark. And, and it's been really enlightening uh, to, to know, you know, how the future of IVF has been changing, uh, how genetics is going to play a role, how digitization is going to change the entire industry. Right. Uh, thank you for your insight and, and, and sharing your experience with all of us. Uh, and, and it has been a real pleasure to have you here. Thank so, you. Thanks a lot.